It seems you can't go a full week these days without hearing about such and such glamorous celebrity, rock star, tabloid darling, and their drug habits. We wouldn't dare celebrate if they were Joe Blow down the street, sticking needles in his arm or manning the meth lab in his basement. So why do we still watch our televisions and read Star Magazine in anticipation of an insane, misanthropic interview on David Letterman, or the next tragic overdose, or the latest million dollar paparazzi snapshot detailing a hopeless descent into drug addiction and corruption? Perhaps it is simply that. These people aren't cooking up a batch of chicken feed for the neighborhood kids, or making frantic 4 a.m. phone calls around town to score the latest low-grade import of black tar heroin from Tijuana. Their drug dealers have PhDs, and their suppliers are among the most powerful corporations in the world. Pfizer, Eli Lilly, Roche, GlaxoSmithKline, the respectable drug pushers. How chic. But of course, this sort of addiction isn't exclusive to celebrities. These companies cater to just about anybody. Men, women, children, even pets. If you have a symptom, they probably have something for it. And if you have enough money to pay for expensive visits to the doctor and medications that range anywhere from five to $500 for a month's supply, you are their ideal demographic. And if your doctor is cool, well, you can be just like Rush Limbaugh in no time. Cats and dogs out there, huh? You must have a lot going on for all that stuff back there, huh? You could, uh, you could have quite a party, all that stuff. You been on Prozac long? Dexedrine? I don't. Interesting drugs. Dexedrine's basically speeding a pill, you know? But I guess a lot of the doctors are balancing out the Prozac with the Dexedrine, so. That liquid morphine, man. <laughs> That'll knock you down, out, around, up and down. Someone's not careful. You can't mix those up, you know. Strong, strong stuff here, boy. Wow. What exactly you have wrong? You need all this stuff. Motherfucker. What? Motherfucker. You what are you talking fucking about? Fucking asshole. Who the fuck? Are you? Who the oh, look, fuck lady, do you think you are? I come in here. You don't know me. You don't know who look, I am. What my life is. And you have the balls, the decency to ask me a question okay. about my life. Yes, lady, what? Fuck you two. Don't you call me lady. I come in here. I give these things to you. You check. You make your phone calls. Look suspicious. Ask questions. I'm sick. I have sickness all around me, and you fucking ask me my life. What's wrong? I'm using death in your bed, in your house. Where's your fucking decency? And then I ask fucking questions. What's wrong? Suck my dick. That's what's wrong in you. You fucking call me lady. Shame on you.
<laughs> hey, baby. How do you cute? Oh, some lady died down the hall. <laughs> I got her flowers. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel good. You feel good? Yeah, I feel... I feel great. You know, I know for the first time since those bullets, I don't feel any pain. No, I don't want it, baby. What do I don't you want mean? it. Uh, what do you... What I, do you... I feel good. And you're not on nothing. You're crooking me, you're a fucking liar. You've been on drugs for five, four or five years, Larry. I have a hard time believing that you feel really great on nothing right now. Is it that hard to believe that I don't want any? Yes, it's that hard Maybe to believe. Baby, I was taking the drugs because I was in pain. I'm not in pain now, so I don't want it. Why would I want it? I don't know. I don't know why you want it. Well, if I don't take it, I'll uh, go into seizures and uh, get really sick, and it makes me feel good. Here. I don't want it! Two hours, you're gonna want it again. I'm done with it. I'm done with it, okay? You've said this before. I've heard this. Stop That's it! That's what it is. That's because you're fucking on. Here, take, take all. Come on, Larry. Stop it! You, stop Get the it. hell away from me! Stop it! You're hurt I yourself. said I don't want. Stop it! You're gonna hurt yourself. Stop it, please. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Been through a lot together. We can make it through this. You can go cold turkey. I'm going cold turkey, and so are you, okay? No. Yes. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. No. I can't, Larry. <laughs> what am I gonna do? What the hell do I need that shit for? I want my mind back. I suppose it can be said that everyone is addicted to something. Caffeine, nicotine, food, sex, food and sex. Even exercise can be addictive, but psychotropic chemicals, even if they are prescribed with the best of intentions, are a tricky subject. They play a dual role in destroying your faculties. Many of these medications contain toxins that kill cells throughout your body, wreak havoc on your stomach lining, lower your seizure threshold, and wear down your heart. Add to this all the negative effects these chemicals have on your central nervous system and the repercussions of addiction in and of itself. Of course, I'm not denying that there are valid and necessary uses for pharmaceuticals. Of course there are. All I'm saying is that doctors need to be more critical when dispensing medications for controversial and sometimes intangible conditions such as ADD, restless leg syndrome, bipolar disorder, anxiety, acid reflux disease, fibromyalgia, depression, and chronic fatigue, especially when the medications prescribed have potential to be abused or make the symptoms worse in the long run. For the patient to be aware of the drugs they are being prescribed would also help in making sure they are being safely treated. The cynic in me does think the pharmaceutical industry doesn't really care about the general public, just so long as people buy the medications they hold the patents for, which raises their market value tenfold. Don't you sometimes wonder why some diseases get so much press for about five years, then just sort of fade into obscurity? When pharmaceutical companies held patents for endless varieties of antidepressants, all you heard about was depression. Now that mood stabilizers are on patent and making money by the truckloads, all you hear about is bipolar disorder. It's a shady business, and that's reason enough to be wary. But what of those who have been addicted to these drugs? The relapse statistics are bleak, to say the least. Most abuse careers are episodic, meaning there are periods of heavy use, intermittent use, and abstinence. Most people who have been seriously addicted to drugs remain addicted for the rest of their lives. The best we as a society can do is be more frugal when it comes to throwing around cure-alls for every ailment that arises. Discomfort, depression, illness, and downtime are all parts of the human condition and are usually temporary. And what are we telling our children when we load them up with even benign medications like antibiotics, laxatives, or children's cough medicines? We're telling them that if they feel bad, there are pills for that. Because there are. There are pills for any conceivable condition. There are pills for when you're 20 pounds overweight, pills for when you have trouble sleeping, 
Pills for when you oversleep. Pills for when you're blue. For when you're too active. For your upset stomach. Pills for your receding hairline. Pills for your premenstrual irritability. Pills for your pain. Pills for your waning libido. Pills for when you're uncomfortable at family reunions. Pills for when you're addicted to pills. With so many options, why not choose wisely?